Here are some quick notes on stellar convection to accompany chapter 6 of To Build a Star. So we've established that, that uh, convection occurs where you have a steep temperature gradient in a star. Um, and so the question is then, where does it actually occur? So we, we know, you know, you can look in the book and in the notes, what temperature gradient you need for convection to occur. Um, and so then the question is, when do we achieve that? So we should look at the temperature gradient for radiative heat transport. And there's basically two components. You have the density times opacity over the temperature to the third in some constants. And then you have a flux term here. And so convection is going to occur um, when your temperature gradient is steep enough, you know, relative to the Schwarzschild criterion that we covered in the um, quick notes on convection to some extent. And so it's going to occur when you either have a high opacity, so this first term is large, or you have a high luminosity. Or, of course, you know, if both are large, then that would cause convection too. But you only need one of these, a high opacity or a high luminosity, um, and that'll cause uh, convection to happen. So, for instance, if we have a really cool region, like let's say a s extended stellar envelope that's very far from the core, then you're going to have partially ionized hydrogen there. And therefore, there's going to be lots of opportunities for photon absorption. So you're going to have a high opacity. Um, so that's one way you can do it is high opacity will give you a steep temperature gradient and cause convection. Alternatively, you can have a really hot region, right? a really high flux region, uh, for instance, where there's lots of nuclear burning going on at high temperature. So for instance, if you have a star a bit more massive than the sun, your core is going to, you're going to be able to have CNO burning, as we talked about in the hydrogen burning quick notes. And so you'll have a high luminosity and therefore a very steep temperature gradient for that scenario. So if we look for all stars, there's this really beautiful plot. What we're looking at is the, basically the radius, but it's really the mass coordinate of a star. So you're, you're up out to the surface of the star in terms of mass um, when you reach one. And this would be the core. And then when we want to consider a given star, this is the log of the mass at zero age main sequence uh, relative to the solar mass. So zero is our sun. And then we have the different spectral types labeled down here. So what you can see is, for instance, for the sun, there's essentially no convection. There's a very thin, in terms of mass coordinate, uh, convective envelope. So these cloudy regions, this is where convection is occurring. So when you go to much cooler stars, then the atmosphere of the star um, is, is cool and there's only partial ionization. So you have a very high opacity and so you have a large convective uh, envelope. And for, for instance, M type stars, you're almost fully convective because of this very high opacity throughout the star it creates a steep temperature gradient. On the opposite end, when you go more massive than the, than the sun, then um, just above basically a solar mass, zero age main sequence, um, then CNO cycle burning can occur. And so then you have a very hot core. And as you get to higher and higher masses, um, so you know, you're up to like 40, 50 masses in this region, or 40, 50 solar masses in this region, then you have a, a very large convective core, convective inner region, and it only gets larger the more massive star you're considering. Uh, one thing I want to mention here is it may look like the sun is essentially fully radiative, except for a little tiny thin envelope of convection. That's true in terms of the mass coordinate, but handily, uh, Kip and Han and Weigert here have plotted the radial uh, extent as well. So this line indicates at which mass coordinate you would be at 25% of the radius for that particular star. And then for a given star, uh, if you want to be at 50% of the radius, that's this line here. And you can also see in terms of luminosity, so where most of the luminosity is produced are these uh, dashed lines here. But the, the point is that uh, high mass stars have convective cores and radiative envelopes, and low mass stars have uh, radiative cores and convective envelopes. And handily, the boundary between high and low mass is right around the sun. So one thing we can consider that's kind of interesting is convection for a given star during the main sequence. So during main sequence evolution, our uh, hydrogen is going to be fused into helium, right? That's what the 
That's the definition of the main sequence. And you might recall from the photons and matter quick notes that when you're at high temperatures and densities, uh, the opacity is dominated by electron scattering. And the electron scattering cross-section is um, discussed in the textbook. It is related to the Thomson scattering cross-section. So it's basically um, just the number of electrons you have times that Thomson scattering cross-section is going to determine your electron scattering cross-section. And this isn't really number here. We're looking at per unit mass. So then that number per unit mass converts to this quantity here. We have 1 over the mean molecular weight times the atomic mass unit, again, times our Thomson scattering cross-section. When you plug in the units here um, and you use the approximation for what the um, mean molecular weight is in terms of um, the hydrogen mass fraction that was in one of the homeworks quite a while ago, then what you find is that the electron scattering cross-section basically goes as the hydrogen mass fraction. So you have a constant times 1 plus the hydrogen mass fraction. Okay, so then when hydrogen burning proceeds in your core, uh, as it does throughout the main sequence, you're steadily reducing the hydrogen mass fraction, and therefore steadily reducing the electron scattering, and therefore steadily reducing the opacity. And so a star with a convective core at zero age main sequence uh, as you evolve from the main sequence, that convective core is actually going to shrink a little bit. And uh, so this is to terminal age main sequence. Is that what that indicates there? So, so that's kind of uh, interesting. Now, one other thing that's interesting to consider for uh, convection and how it in, uh, influences stellar structure is convective mixing. So this uh, here, we're talking about changing the composition of the star. So any region that's hosting convection, it's going to become chemically homo homogeneous, right, due to mixing. So if you start out with some, this is just an indication of the composition, some composition, mass fraction of a given element, as a function of radius, let's say you have this profile. If you were to turn on a convective core, then you're basically homogeneous in this region. You're just going to, that's going to be all the same composition. If you were to have a convective envelope, then you're, you'd have a nice smooth composition here. So in the radiative regions, there's not really a lot of mixing going on. You maintain that composition profile, uh, for instance, created by nuclear burning. Um, but in the convective regions, you're essentially homogeneous. Um, so one consequence is this, of this, as we talked about in the convection quick notes, that in the presence of a composition gradient, you need to consider the Ladeau criterion. Well, here we can see that for stellar structure, the Lado criterion is going to is going to pretty quickly become irrelevant once your convection sets in, because the composition gradient is completely erased. Right? You started out with a composition gradient, you you turn on convection, when that turns on, the the Lado criterion will be relevant, but once convection turns on, then you don't really care about the Lado criterion anymore. You're just into the Schwarzschild shield uh, criterion, because there is no composition gradient anymore. So that's one interesting consequence. Another one is that when you have a convective core, you're, you're not only smoothing out the composition in terms of like all the metals, all the stuff produced by stellar burning, but you're also going to mix in the unburnt hydrogen from regions that are a little bit further from the center of the star. Right? So you're going to mix in the surrounding material that, that contains some amount of unburned helium. So this is going to extend the life of your uh, high mass main sequence star relative to like uh, what you'd consider for a lower mass star, just in terms of burning your core hydrogen. So what, what do I mean by that? So for the sun, um, we, we kind of showed in exercise 5.4 that um, in the sun, you're going to burn around 10% of the stellar hydrogen content is going to be processed in, in nuclear burning. When you go to a much higher mass star, like a 60 solar mass star, there there's a, a massive uh, convective core, as we, as we saw. It's about half of the mass of the star, three quarters of the mass of the star. And so in this case, um, the majority of the hydrogen is going to be mixed into your core and eventually is going to be processed. And so because you have more hydrogen to burn through, then you're going to have a much longer lifetime on the main sequence, which is kind of cool. And that is it for these quick notes on stellar convection.